Okay, so we're starting. Welcome to our colloquium. And today we're discussing heterogeneous catalysis and how we can study it at the atomic scale. So as many of you know, this understanding of heterogeneous catalysis is very, very important if you work with electrochemistry and electrocatalysis. And this is because if you don't understand how adsorption and chemical reactions occur on the plane surface, it's hard to understand how electrosorption and electrocatalysis work. We discussed many times here previously that a liquid electrolyte and the double layer, they hugely complicate the whole system. However, even without any electrolyte, the complexity of catalytic reactions can become quite overwhelming. And so our speaker today is Professor Hans Joachim Freund, one of the greatest experts um, in heterogeneous catalysis and in surface sciences. His interests are also in mostly in mechanistic and atomistic studies and understanding of reactions at, at different surfaces, including oxide surfaces. Professor Freund, he received his PhD in 1978 at the University of Köln in Germany. Then he did his postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania and Cerex Corporation. And then in 1981, he became a scientific assistant at the University of Köln. Then in 1983, he moved to the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg to become an associate professor there. He spent about four years there, and then he moved to the Ruhr University of Bochum, where he started his work on oxide surfaces. Now, finally, since 1996, he's been a director and a professor at Fritz Haber Institute. So, Professor Freund, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to your talk and all the discussions that we're going to have afterwards. Uh, now the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for the kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, uh, deal with an audience that is uh, maybe looking for electrocatalysis or electrochemistry. But as you pointed out, I will dwell on um, UHV studies in, uh, in heterogeneous uh, model systems for catalysts. And so thank you very much. and. Uh, I will, uh, from time to time, mention the connection to electrochemistry if there is any in my view, okay? So should I now uh, open my screen? Absolutely, go ahead, yeah. So I hope you can see it all. Mm -hmm. um, what I will do is I will guide you through after a, uh, an introduction to uh, this um, uh, topic of model catalysts, which, by the way, has been touched upon by a previous speaker early on in this uh, series by uh, Joachim Buda, who has been working with me for many years as a student and as a, a postdoc and, and uh, who uh, uh, has now moved this field into uh, electrochemistry. So. Those of you who are interested in, in learning more about this connection, uh, the, there is this uh, YouTube uh, with Jörg uh, that you can uh, have a look at. So I will give you a brief introduction and then I will guide you through three conceptual studies. One is connected to understanding active sites in a catalyst at the oxide metal interface, which is actually a rather um, a general uh, feature and important in catalysis. And then we have, we'll move to reactions in confined space. I'll come back to this. Uh, also an important area in uh, heterogeneous catalysis. And at the end, I will tell you a little bit about a new uh, analytical technique, uh, only ap applicable in ultra vacuum, so called surface action spectroscopy using messengers is actually uh, coming from the gas phase, but it can be easily transferred, not easily, but it can be transferred to uh, the surface and give some interesting and, and uh, uh, insight and perspective to future studies. So uh, let's start. Uh, uh, you all know uh, catalysis is typically divided into heterogeneous, homogeneous, and enzymatic catalysis. Um, heterogeneous catalysis uh, happens at the surface of a solid, typically, uh, in connection either with a gas phase or with a liquid. Uh, homogeneous catalysis is in one phase in a liquid usually, and typically typical catalysts are this uh, 
uh, are these uh, complexes that they that are used and sort of uh, uh, an enlargement of these complexes could be you could look at it in an enzyme where you also have an active site uh, somewhere in the in the molecule and that also typically happens of course in uh, homogeneous phase but because of the size of these uh, um, uh, proteins um, one could look at it as something in between homogeneous and, and heterogeneous uh, systems. Now we will concentrate on heterogeneous catalysis and I will show you two examples. One is connected sort of with a classical uh, uh, surface uh, reaction where we have a solid and a gas uh, interacts with it. Uh, and uh, the second one is something people call reaction in confined space, something that, for example, happens in zeolites and these materials that have pores and where the molecules uh, move into the pores, react there, and then have to get out of the uh, pore again. And that constrains, of course, as you can imagine, the kinetics uh, of the system. And it's actually quite interesting uh, that uh, we can actually contribute perhaps a little bit from the side of uh, head of uh, surface uh, uh, science to understand these things. Now, the, uh, the, the studies of model systems uh, go back quite a while. Uh, I have put uh, up a, a slide here that uh, I published together with Joachim Zawa uh, several years ago. And you can, you can have models that, for example, relate to complexes or to small clusters. Uh, Earl Mutatis uh, uh, in, on the West Coast uh, was one of the early guys who, who actually used that idea and tried to um, uh, transfer ideas from those, uh, in, prin in principle, molecular ideas to heterogeneous catalysis. And this was supported uh, also by a very uh, uh, important calculations, for example, by Paul Begas, who was uh, 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 working on it uh, at the time and still is actually. Uh, and, uh, and then of course, uh, at the same time, uh, surface science that was 60s, late 60s, 70s, surface science started to work in detail on metal surfaces. And two names that I put up here is one Gerhard Attel, our colleague here at the Institute, and also Gabor uh, Samarjai, who both worked on uh, metal, uh, single crystal metal surfaces. This gives you the option to know sort of where the atoms are because you can do structural studies and determine what the structure of the surface is. And, um, and these uh, studies uh, sort of uh, started uh, the, 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 the studies on, on models. Now, if you want to approach uh, a real catalyst uh, with uh, a model system, you have to take into account that um, catalysts are rather complex materials, usually combinations of materials. And they usually consist of a support uh, for something that is supported on it. For example, small metal particles or, an, or oxide particles. And these supports are, as, I, as, I, as you can imagine, are often uh, oxides. And so people started in the, in the, the 70s, the late 70s, to really uh, get involved in, in oxides. And I have a list of some early work uh, or some reviews of the early work uh, in a later, in the next uh, slide. But the point is that people then started to look at uh, single crystals of oxides. And the next step was to put metal particles on these oxides so as to mimic um, uh, uh, the, the, the morphology of a real catalyst. And of course, when you do this, you have to take into account that the single crystal studies on the metals were also related to real catalysts in the sense by assuming that the structure of these uh, metal particles resemble to some extent a single crystal uh, metal surface. But that, as you know, is not uh, 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 often not the case because the electronic structure if the particle is small enough will depend on size. And of course, the availability of the sites uh, becomes important, in particular, the site between the support, oxide support, and, um, and the metal particle, as it's sort of uh, shown here. 
And then, of course, there are something, a phenomenon in, in heterogeneous catalysis that is called strong metal support interaction. It's a little bit of a mis misleading term, but it means that the oxide can also move onto the particle, enclose it, and makes it even more complicated, the structure. So in other words, uh, we when we go through uh, model studies, we have to mimic <clears throat> or catch the complexity of the system by modifying uh, our models. And there is another point that I think is very important, and that's the fact that we always need to work together with theory. Uh, and uh, theory has developed uh, much beyond what is indicated here uh, to be a real uh, sort of important tool in understanding what we uh, really measure. And so I think it's this symbiosis between experiment and theory that leads to a better understanding uh, of these model systems. And if we increase the complexity high enough, then eventually we may be able to uh, understand what's going on on a real catalyst. Here is uh, what I uh, already said, uh, it, the beginning of uh, this model, more complex model studies uh, were in the, in, induced by the fact that people started to look into metal oxides. That started over a long period of time, and I've listed here Vic Henrik's book on the surface science of metal oxides, and Claudine Nougaras, uh, she's a theorist in France, uh, her work on, on these materials. Um, at, the, at the time, early on, uh, people started to work on titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide uh, can be as a semiconductor, so you can work with surface science tools uh, on these systems um, uh, by uh, of using also uh, electrons uh, uh, as uh, in information carriers, I come back to this, which uh, you, if you work on insulators is more difficult. And, um, and that's why, for example, we will start to talk about thin films. And Uli Diebold, who also gave a, a, a talk in this series, was one of the main players in looking into the surface science of titanium dioxide. So was Jeff Thornton uh, in, uh, in England. Uh, and I have mentioned those too. And then people started to actually put early, uh, put uh, metals uh, onto these oxide supports. And there are some people mentioning mentioned who were in this area uh, early on, who uh, then um, uh, reviewed what was uh, happening before. And so it, it's, uh, if you want to get into this literature, that is a way to get in there. Now, as I said, we are working on thin films. The reason is that, as I said also, we are using often uh, electrons as information carriers. Now, if you do, for example, an XPS study on, <coughs> excuse me, on, on uh, insulating oxides, what happens is uh, the, the, during the measurement, uh, the, the surface charges up and, uh, and um, uh, changes the measured binding energies. And if you don't know exactly what's happening, you are basically don't know how to interpret the data. And so in, in particular, if you want to compare to theory, that is then detrimental. So you have to work on thin films where you have a metal underneath, which uh, can always uh, compensate for the charge. And that's the big advantage of using thin films. And then you can put something onto the thin film and work on it. But you have to keep in mind that the film has to be thick enough that it is not the interplay between the buried interface and the vacuum metal, uh, oxide interface that plays the dominant role. And I will send, sh show you an example uh, how uh, influential that can be uh, in my first example. Of course, you have to make sure that your oxide covers the surface properly, otherwise you are uh, measuring different things on the metal and the oxide. And also you can modify the oxide by having dopants in between. I will also come back to this later on. You can also use uh, other techniques to uh, interrupt uh, the, uh, the crosstalk between the buried interface and the uh, vacuum uh, oxide interface by putting blocking layers. And even you can make oxides that you can peel off from the surface. And I will also show you as we go along uh, an example uh, that uh, is connected to this. Now, the first example here is to show you that when we grow thin films, we have to be careful that we grow either thin films, thin, very thin films, four monolayers, for example, or thicker films. And there is a difference because the metal underneath, when you 
probe the electronic structure has an influence on what you do. This is an SDM image of a magnesium oxide surface. You can see it's extremely well ordered. If you have an oxygen defect, you can see uh, the color center uh, reaches out in a certain uh, uh, far out in the thing. And you can really see the difference between the very thin film and the more thicker film, which resembles the bulk by doing XPS. Uh, that's done here uh, in uh, uh, on magnesium and uh, oxygen, and magnesium 2P and oxygen 1S. Um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the measurement uh, done by at, with XPS in, in uh, normal emission and in grazing emission. And you, as you know, in XPS and grazing emission, you are more sur sur surface sensitive than in others. And this is something that has been done on the thick film. And here you can see the surface chemical shift for the magnesium, which is absent for the oxygen, simply because the oxygen is more flexible in its electronic structure to take care of the differences. But that would not be seen really as pronounced on the thin film. So it's, it's really the surface structure on the very thin film is different from uh, the, uh, the thicker films. And uh, one of the first SDM images were not, were not the ones that I show you here, which are from our work, but from Wolf Dieter Schneider's work at EPFL that is mentioned here below. So now we come to the first example uh, uh, to identify active sites at the metal oxide interface in supported nanoparticle systems. Now, we are using the scanning tunneling microscope uh, to do this. And there is one important point that you have to understand. If you want to use the SDM to image a particle, you have to take into account that the, um, that the tip has a finite size. And that if you don't have a single atom at the tip, which is often not the case, then you may have interference between different tunneling positions when you move the tip across a three-dimensional particle. That's sort of schematically indicated here, grown on this thin film. Now, the best idea would be, the best thing would be have a flat uh, particle, and that flat particle could then really be imaged uh, uh, in high resolution uh, with the SDM. So that's indicated schematically here. Here, down here, you see um, a, a real image of a particle, and you see the flat surface is very well resolved because of that effect. But the edges uh, and, the, and the, the, the side regions, you can see, are washed out more. So it's more difficult, even though you see some here, the thing is flat enough, but usually this is washed out, and you, it doesn't give you a complete uh, view, especially on the uh, on the edge side. So having these flat uh, particles is a, an ideal situation. And here comes uh, the, the the first example. And that has to do with gold. Now, as you some of you may know, uh, Masataka Haruta in the late 80s, late 70s, uh, came up with this idea of using gold. Uh, for CO oxidation. And he showed that CO oxidation on gold particles, supported gold particles, show, uh, happens at very low temperature, unexpected for everybody. Uh, and uh, this was taken up uh, also by Graham Hutchings, uh, who uh, uh, showed that gold can replace mercury-based catalysts uh, in hydrogenation processes. And that was a very important discovery. Now, if you put gold, uh, you want to use a gold model, uh, you to put gold, a gold particle, it's schematically shown here, on a, say, a magnesium oxide surface, the gold particle will be three dimensional. And uh, that's not surprising because uh, that's the way metals typically behave. They don't wet uh, uh, an oxide surface. However, um, uh, uh, the, um, the authors of, this, of the cited paper here uh, uh, they showed that, in fact, uh, when you put the gold particle not on a bulk MGO, but rather on a, thi a thin film, like, like two monolayers of magnesium oxide, the, the three-dimensional structure collapses and forms a flat pancake. And that flat, pa flat pancake comes about because electrons are tunneled, tunneling through the thin film and since gold is one of the most electronegative metal uh, systems, 
almost as as uh, electronegative as uh, uh, the higher um, uh, um, uh, the higher alkali, not alkali, uh, the, the, the halogens. Uh, then uh, it is uh, it is not surprising that when you have a thin film and you have electrons on the thin on the flat uh, uh, panel here, then that the electrons try to stay away from each other and they drive this. It seems this uh, two-dimensional growth uh, of the system, and um, and uh, so so uh, that was shown by the uh, by the people uh, cited here, and uh, we took this up and said, can we actually do this in reality? And uh, Martin Sterrer, who was the leading uh, postdoc at the time uh, here, he showed that when you grow these very thin films. Uh, you the, you grow flat gold uh, particles on this film. However, if you increase the thickness of the film already at eight monolayers, uh, you can see that you basically only create three-dimensional particles. And we thought this must be due to this um, to this uh, observe this this uh, prediction that was made and based on 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 the theoretical calculations. And so we moved on to 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 look at this in more detail. If you grow thin, uh, very th small uh, gold particles, they also form these uh, very flat uh, systems. And here is an, a gold 18 cluster. You see the blob if here only, but then we see the, um, the patterns that show up uh, when you uh, go to the various um, uh, energies here uh, at uh, below and above uh, Fermi. And you see that they have discrete uh, um, nodal structure. And this discrete nodal structure allows you basically to count the number of electrons that are on this uh, little particle. Because uh, if you think about it, um, and the, this was all uh, also uh, supported through through theory from the Hekinen group in Yuvaskala in uh, Finland, then you know uh, S states have no no uh, nodal plane, one nodal plane, P two, F and G four. And if you then go back and count the number of nodal planes, the highest occupied state has four nodal planes. So this, this is a G orbital, so to speak. And you can now put in electrons until you have reached uh, the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate number to fill the, uh, the states of the gold. And then you look at the first unoccupied, it is still um, a, a four, a, a, has four nodal planes. And so, we can basically see the gold uh, 18 is a four minus particle. So if you have that, then you have four electrons and these electrons spill out to the rim. Now, if you go away from this very small particle to larger particles, they have odd shapes. And you can see from the uh, STM images that um, uh, the, uh, our, the, the, the intensity of the, of, the, of the states is basically localized at the rim. And Hanno Hekinen calculated these uh, structures, and he came up with the point that the uh, electrons are actually effectively located at the at the kink sites of the rim. So they are located in specific uh, places where electrons are well accommodated, and that's uh, sort of seen here also in these uh, images. Now. Uh, if you put a molecule like carbon monoxide onto the surface, you can see individual CO molecules uh, on, the, uh, on the support here of the magnesium oxide, in this case, grown uh, on, a, on a silver uh, uh, single crystal uh, substrate. Uh, the, uh, the, the CO's are not individually seen, but if you go through, uh, Im through uh, uh, imaging at different energies where you can excite certain excitations in the CO, then if you, if you use the hindered rotation at 45 millivolts, you can see at negative uh, voltage, you see uh, the black, uh, the black uh, hole, so to speak, due to the loss and the gain when you go to positive um, uh, voltage. So you can, you can see that there is CO and it's localized at the rim, but we wanted to see it in more detail. And so we were thinking of what is a better molecule uh, to look at. And um, since my group was uh, consisting of chemists and physicists, uh, Christian Stieler, who was a physicist, asked one of the chemists, do you have a molecule that doesn't do much, but that somehow absorbs on the surface? 
And uh, one of our, his colleagues told him, well, take this molecule. Um, this is isoferone. Uh, isoferone is a, uh, uh, a hydrocarbon, a cyclic hydrocarbon with an oxygen at the, at the edge. So it looks like a, 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 a big CO molecule with a too large carbon atom. Now, if you put that onto these gold clusters, you can see they are localized at the rim. They're all localized at the rim, and you can in see individual, individual molecules. And you can now probe the electronic structure by looking at the, uh, at the SDM again, uh, uh, depending on the sample bias. And depending on where you put the tip, you can see the closer you get to the rim, uh, the more different the spectra gets. And that has to do with the fact that the, the molecules at the rim influence the electronic structure of these small clusters. Um, and uh, and so that that is uh, sort of uh, an important aspect uh, to to look at. And we had taken uh, um, not only uh, the uh, the SDM image, but also taken infrared spectra to make sure that it's really isoferone uh, that we have uh, at the surface. Now the good thing about uh, SDM is you can not only uh, um, uh, image, but you can also manipulate the molecules on the surface. And these, since these molecules are weakly bound, you can actually pull them away from the rim. And so you can take a, a particle and peel off these uh, molecules from the rim so that you are in the position of being directly able to compare uh, the same cluster with and without the molecules on top and look at the electronic structure. And that leads to the idea that uh, we can actually do this not only for, um, uh, for um, uh, isoferone, but we can also do it for smaller molecules. And we came to the point that we uh, thought maybe it's a good idea to use carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide, as you all know, is a very important molecule. And we had done studies, and I'll come back to this in a minute, later, earlier on, when we put uh, carbon dioxide onto metal surfaces and knew that in order to activate the CO2, you have to uh, place electrons onto the CO2. You will see uh, how that happens in detail later. Now, here you see the cluster with the, the CO2 molecules at the rim, and you can see here the states of the cluster with and without uh, the molecules. And you can see that the, 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 the slope of the different states uh, with the molecules is steeper than without the molecules. And that makes a lot of sense. Here's the difference plotted. And that makes a lot of sense because what are you having in the simplest picture? Well, the particle describes sort of uh, a pot of electrons, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you put the electronic states into this pot, uh, you will have the various electronic states here, states here in the simplest case here, a uh, particle in a box. Uh, if you shrink the pot, then the states will have uh, stronger energy differences, right? And so that's uh, one of the reasons why this, this happens, because when the molecules are at the rim, they sort of take electrons away from the cluster, and that means that the electrons have to see uh, sit in a smaller potential well. And that gives rise to these different slopes uh, that you see here, and that depends very much on whether you have a physiosorbent molecule, as the case in isoporone, or uh, a real interacting, chemically interacting molecule like CO2, where you get stronger differences. So that led us to the idea that maybe we can use that particle, those particles, to actually uh, activate carbon dioxide. And it is very well known that carbon dioxide, if you form anions and you have enough carbon dioxide around, you can form oxalates. So uh, oxalate is C2H, uh, C2O4. So it's basically two uh, dimerized uh, CO2 with two extra electrons. And uh, we should then, if you think about it, uh, since the gold 3D, 3D gold particle doesn't have the electron transfer, while the 2D particle has the, uh, uh, the electron transfer, the 2D particle should be the obvious one to actually induce reactivity at the rim. 
And uh, you can see here that uh, the electron affinity of the CO2, which is uh, negative in the case of the individual molecule, but it's actually positive for a carbon dioxide dimer, can actually induce this react reactivity to uh, form the oxalate. That is, you form a carbon-carbon bond with two uh, uh, two um, oxygen molecules sitting on each side. Side. Uh, this can actually be proven by uh, 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 infrared spectroscopy. Whoops. Uh, this is the CO2 on the clean uh, MGO, and um, and this uh, uh, clean MGO is actually. Uh, um, uh, has still uh, some interaction with the CO2. And that has to do with, uh, I showed you before, there are color centers on the MGO. So that there are places where the MGO has electrons and there you can form a carboxylate, a CO2 minus. And that is the, uh, the CO2 minus uh, that you form. Now we can actually prove that that is the case because we are in the position to not only label the CO2 by isotopic labeling, in other words, carbon and oxygen, but we can also, since we grow a thin film, we can grow the thin film from oxygen, uh, from, ox from uh, isotopic labeled oxygen. And if you take that information together, it's clear that this is exactly what happens. And the same argument is used, and it will not go into the details of it, uh, when you look at the infrared of the formed uh, oxalate. Here are the oxalate bands here. This is the, the one in the middle, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, carboxylate still remains, but this is the oxalate. And if you change uh, the, the carbon and the oxygen, and you remember that the oxalate is bound by a carbon-carbon bond, you can understand the changes uh, in the uh, infrared spectrum directly in proof that it is actually oxalate that forms. Now, there is another point. We are growing these very thin oxide uh, uh, gold particles on the oxide, but it is also known if we heat the system up, the gold has a tendency to move and to agglomerate into bigger particles. And these particles are then again three-dimensional because the energy for the thermal uh, activation overcomes uh, the energy for the electron transfer. And that means that by heating the system up and you form um, uh, three-dimensional particles, the oxalate formation is quenched. So you go, you go from the CO2 on the clean uh, MGO uh, back to that same situation where you have mainly the CO2 sitting on the defects of the MGO while the oxalate bands completely disappear due to the fact that gold is growing three-dimensional. So, in, in, indeed, we can see some reactivity uh, of the system uh, here, and that reactivity is consistent with the observed uh, spectra and structural information. So uh, here is uh, just uh, the, uh, the point where you see the, the two-dimensional particles and eventually the growth of these three-dimensional particles, which are no longer uh, uh, CO2, uh, no longer activating CO2 molecules. But uh, this is a, a sort of a, 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 a system that is sort of disconnected to reality because in a catalyst, of course, you have the, the, the bulk oxide material. Now, can you use the ideas that we've just developed, this electron transfer, also for systems where you have a bulk oxide or a, a similar to bulk oxide, and you change this, the, 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 the electronic structure of the bulk oxide by dopants to perhaps induce through the dopants the electron transfer to uh, the gold uh, at the surface. And indeed, that's the case. We have used this uh, in the case of calcium oxide films, which are shown here. They are rather well structured. Of course, you see edges and corners and so forth and terraces, but they are well structured. And we can put, because we are growing them on a molybdenum substrate, so simply by heating, you can make molybdenum atoms move into the calcium oxide film and basically replace uh, the calcium atoms. 
Now, molybdenum has different oxidation state and it can easily adopt the molybdenum 2 plus that would be necessary to replace the calcium oxide in the, cal the, the calcium in the calcium oxide. But it doesn't cost much energy to actually move the molybdenum from 2 plus to 3 plus. In other words, give an electron away. And if you put an electronegative atom like gold on the surface, and the electronegativity gain energy energy gain is comparable to the, the energy necessary to go from one oxidation state to the other, you can maybe do this. And in fact, that's what happens. This is uh, 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 the, uh, the pristine calcium oxide film with no molybdenum implanted and every gold atom is three dimensional. As soon as we put uh, molybdenum into the lattice, they all grow flat. And you can see the electronic structure here on the, on the electron wave that goes across the particle. So you can actually use the idea of transferring electron, not only for these very thin films, but you can transfer it uh, also to a more complex uh, situation where you have a bulk oxide. And uh, if you can then image these things, you can see um, uh, these are three dim two dimensional. You can even see atomic uh, uh, structure that I didn't show you in the other case, but here you can see it clearly also, and that's the situation. And, and these particles on the calcium oxide behave very similar, in a very similar way as, um, as the, the, uh, the one on the very thin film. And so we can sort of uh, uh, draw a connection between uh, uh, this model that we have used to induce electron transfer to a situation that you could actually uh, uh, create uh, for bulk-based uh, materials. This was the first example. Second example is now going to uh, what we call confined space. Now, what do we mean? What we mean, and then it's not our idea, uh, first idea, there were other people who were looking into this. Um, can we have, say, for example, um, carbon nanotubes where you have limited space? And how does the limited space in the nanotube uh, change the reactivity of the system? Uh, I already mentioned if you have zeolites where you have uh, particles inside the zeolite, how does that influence the reactivity as compared to the open situation? And one way of modeling it is growing a thin layer of something uh, on top of a metal. Use the metal as the uh, as the uh, the place where the chemistry starts and, and use the, the, the membrane on top, so to speak, to confine space. And this was actually the idea came from the Bau group, Sina Bau, who was in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the, in the CAS, in, uh, in um, the Chemical uh, uh, Physics Institute uh, in, in China. Uh, and he came up with using uh, carbon uh, graphite, a little graph graphene um, or uh, hexagonal or boronitride uh, flakes to see whether one can bring molecules in between these uh, systems. And he could show that indeed you can bring these molecules in and that this will uh, induce uh, chemical reactions that are uh, rather different. But th the studies were not very detailed in the sense uh, that uh, the kinetics were not um, uh, detail in, uh, detailed investigated. Other people start, did this uh, studies on, on uh, uh, carbon nanotubes, single wall ca uh, carbon nanotubes, where the size of the carbon nanotube determines whether the reactant can leave or the reaction can happen at all and so forth. We had started to look at, um, at a silica film uh, and look at the diffusion of CO and D2 into the film. And I will discuss this aspect uh, in a little bit, uh, in, in just uh, uh, following up. So here is the silica film. And the silica film has been investigated by a number of groups, uh, in particular, uh, D. Wayne Goodman, whom I mentioned before. Uh, and we had a long debate on what the structure is. There is a possibility to grow a monolayer where the silicon is connected to four oxygen atoms, and one of the oxygen atoms is actually chemically bound to the surface, forming a monolayer. But there is a very interesting 
other uh, uh, possibility, if you flip that monolayer around and you put another monolayer on top, right, then you get a bilayer. This bilayer has exact SIO2 stoichiometry opposite to this one, which is more uh, uh, SI2O5. And you can see in the infrared, this is the uh, monolayer with a strong silicon oxygen bond in the infrared. And this is the bilayer, which has no direct bond to the substrate. It's basically bound to the substrate by dispersive so, uh, forces. And that opens, of course, a possibility. If the space is big enough, then uh, this would be ideal because you could do the reactions like uh, Xena Bao did it for carbon. But here you have the other option is not to have to bring in the molecules from the side underneath the flake, but because the structure of this these uh, silica layers is such that you have these hexagonal holes. So if you look at that from the top, it looks like this. The bilayer looks exactly the same here. You have these holes and small molecules could diffuse through these holes, similar to the situation you find, for example, in a zeolite, mimicking the situation in a zeolite where this controls the diffusion of the reactants uh, to the active site, which would then be uh, somewhere here uh, underneath. So um, uh, this was the this was the idea, and uh, then we made a, an interesting discovery because we were looking at the structure of these silica films. These are not a very well resolved SDM, much better ones, but this is the early work. And you see these hexagonal rings here. Uh, they come in in in, in grains and they have grain boundaries and so forth, but the structure is pretty much ordered. So you have a very good, well-ordered structure. Now, if you change the preparation conditions a little bit, then you see this structure. And when I saw this the first time, it reminded me of something that I learned about, namely the silica uh, uh, crystal glass transition. And I'll come back to this in a moment. This is obviously an amorphous or vitreous structure that gives rise not to an ordered lead pattern, but rather to a ring structure. And the question is, what is the exact structure of that ring? And Marcus Haider and co-workers in my group uh, uh, found out that if you use an, an, uh, an SDM that they develop that not can only not, not only do SDM, but also non-contact AFM, because it uses a tuning fork that has a tip that is directly can be connected uh, to a base so that you can do SDM and AFM on the same uh, site. And you can see here exactly the same area scanned with SDM uh, and with AFM. And you can see the AFM is uh, sensitive to the silicon atoms, while the SDM is, is uh, sensitive to the oxygen atoms. So you can actually not only see the same structure in both images, but you can use this information to determine the stoichiometry. And that's exactly SiO2, and it's vitreous. And if you compare this structure with a suggestion Bill Sakaryasin made in 1932, uh, based on his idea that each silicon is surrounded by four oxygen atoms, and it is only the registry of these tetrahedra that change by going from the crystalline to the, 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 uh, uh, the vitreous phase, which was big debated in the literature, it shows that indeed, this is what happens. This is exactly uh, proving uh, Sakaryasin's uh, hypothesis that, was, uh, uh, that came up in 1932. While there were uh, various structural determinations using X-ray diffraction as well as um, <clears throat> neutron diffraction to deduce that this is what happens. This is the first um, uh, uh, um, imaging in, in real space that you can really see that this is what happens. Now, this is an interesting uh, area because uh, you can then look at uh, the coexistence of crystalline and vitreous structures. And this is something we are very interested in because we are interested in how the, um, how the, uh, the structure changes going from the crystalline to the vitreous structure. In other words, which of these ring sizes develop first as you go deep into the uh, into the vitreous structure? And that's something we are working on uh, at present, uh, uh, building up a new, very uh, fast scanning SDM 
uh, that I will not talk about because of lack of time, uh, to, to study this effect in greater detail. What I wanted to show you is we can use this membrane now to show to, to discuss very simple reactions. This is a reaction where we diffuse hydrogen through this membrane, and it doesn't have to creep under from the side. And we have oxygens on the surface, and the hydrogen reacts with the oxygens and forms water. And the water dissorbs and can actually dis dis uh, escape again from, uh, the, 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 um, uh, from the surface. And we study this with a particular technique uh, that is uh, connected with synchrotron uh, study that we have built up this uh, beam line. <coughs> uh, we call it the smart microscope. Um, here is this, the sample. That's those are the X-rays coming in. They excite the electrons, and the electrons are uh, going through a beam splitter and are actually uh, aberration corrected through a mirror system, um, and then. Uh, energy analyzed and then imaged on the screen. And then we can not only do uh, X-ray uh, photoelectron spectroscopy in that way, we can also do a lead, uh, in other words, lean, uh, low energy electron microscopy by using the beam splitter and the electron uh, beam coming from the side. So this technique has been used to look at this reaction. And you can see here, uh, a, a, a movie that was taken as the reaction passes on. The reaction obviously starts from a whoops, starts from a, a certain place, and moves across the surface. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is that we are saturating the metal surface with oxygen, uh, and if you do this, you form a structure that leaves no place for hydrogen dissociation. So the dissociation of the hydrogen can only happen at defect sites where the oxygen coverage is not perfect. And once the hydrogen is dissociated there, it'll find the oxygen, forms OH and water, and then the reaction proceeds from there on. And this gives rise to this uh, reaction front that moves across the surface. These darker lines are actually uh, um, uh, step bunches across the single crystal. We can stop that reaction and then do XPS, and you can see there is a ray, an area uh, that is uh, uh, oxygen rich, that is where the reaction has not yet happened, and that is oxygen poor, where the reaction has already swamped over and gone across. And this is the this is the uh, the reaction front that you see, and uh, and so this is allows allows us to study this uh, effect in in detail, and. Uh, in, in particular, what we can do is we can look at the reaction from speed as a function of temperature. And if we do this, we can create um, we can create uh, uh, these these uh, plots, right? Uh, and uh, the the plots allow you to determine the apparent activation energy. This is the one over t. Uh, to the logarithm of the uh, velocity. And it shows you something uh, that is the, uh, the uh, vitreous film. This is the crystalline film. They're almost the same. There is a difference here in the, in the, in the cross, in the uh, uh, section here, but uh, the, the energy is apparently the same simply because the hydrogen is a small molecule. It doesn't matter whether you have six member rings or larger member rings. But you can also take this, this uh, this uh, silica film away. I told you uh, that we can make films where we can peel off the silica. And indeed, we can do this in this case, but we don't have to peel it off. We just don't put it on top. And then you can measure the same uh, reaction without the confinement that, uh, um, uh, sheet. And what you see is um, uh, the activation energy changes. In fact, the activation energy is almost double uh, the activation energy that you see in this. And when I showed this the first time, my colleague, a chemical engineer, said, oh, this is, of course, this is diffusion control. Because when you have diffusion control, it typically goes uh, uh, a factor of two lower. But then the question is, which diffusion controls this? Is it the diffusion of the water through the film away from the surface? It, probably not the hydrogen onto the surface, but what happens on the surface? And this is a very difficult question uh, to, to actually answer. And so what we did was 
we uh, looked uh, for theoretical support and Joachim Sauer, uh, Dennis Uzviat and uh, uh, Tom Mullen uh, uh, it, it helped us uh, a lot. Mullen is a uh, theoretical physicist who works on atmospheric chemistry. So he is used to using systems of uh, differential equations, complex system of differential equations. And so here are the four, four critical steps, hydrogen dissoci dissociation, uh, OH formation, which is the rate determining step usually, then water formation and water desorption. And if we put that into, um, into uh, the theory, and here is the, the, the results from a, a huge set of uh, a differential of uh, 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 DFT calculations for, this, for the, the series for the different steps, you can see the most important one, and that doesn't change through uh, having the, the, the confinement, is the, um, is the OH formation. That's this big uh, uh, energy jump here to the transition state. And that doesn't change much, but the rest uh, does change. And so the question is, what actually is then, if that is, if it's not an influence of the primary uh, uh, activation energy uh, leading to the formation of the water, what is it that does it? And this has been then uh, modeled, and the modeling leads to the conclusion that um, what you have, what what the, the diffusion, it is actually the hydrogen diffusion uh, on the surface. That is, the hydrogen goes to this defect where it dissociates, and then the next hydrogen, when it comes in, has to diffuse to the to where the oxygen is still on the surface because the rest of it has already been re removed. And it is this diffusion of the of the hydrogen on the surface that controls the reactivity uh, of the system. For me, that was quite an unexpected uh, result because I had bet on that it's the water desorption from the surface. Uh, that is blocked uh, to some extent by other things. So it is important to do these kind of calculations and 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 compare it to uh, to uh, to experiment. And you can see here the uh, the comparison between confined experiment and the uh, the the, uh, the modeling is pretty good. However, there is an interesting effect when we did this and they did the calculations. They noticed that when you change the oxygen concentration on the surface, because the, surf, the, the silica film is only bound by dispersive forces, it tends to move a little bit. So obviously, uh, that's something that people who work on layered materials have observed in the past, oftentimes, where these uh, uh, sh shear planes, they really uh, vary in position. And, and then we said, okay, then let's do the structure, the uh, structure determination, doing a lead IV. And Edma Soares, who was a guest from Brazil, from Minas Gerais, did the calculation. And you can see, uh, it took us quite a number of calculations before we reached the result showing here at the end, which has a so-called Penry off factor, reliability factor. Uh, where the comparison of experiment and theory, as shown here, is decent below 0.2, that gives us a reliable result. And that shows that, indeed, um, we have to work with a system that is not given by a single structure, but you can only get decent uh, uh, low energy electron diffraction result if, in the calculations, you superimpose different uh, positions of the silica film that is indicated here by blue and red spots relative to the substrate. And it's only if you do this that you gain decent crystallographic information from IV curves. And that gives you basically this structure. And uh, this is the average position and the heights and so forth. They are constant. They don't change. It is the lateral position that changes. And this is something that was quite unexpected, but uh, it shows you how complex the situation is, and you can have the same thing in a silica, in a in a in a, in a zeolite, where the caves can be flexible, especially when you go later on to moths, where it is even more flexible. This flexibility changes the situation quite dramatically. So, with this, I show you in the last few minutes um, uh, uh, another approach that we have used to uh, to look into. The spectroscopy of surfaces, and and this is the action spectroscopy using messengers, and uh, and this spectroscopy or this idea comes from uh, the gas phase uh, community. 
In the gas phase community, people try to take clusters, make them in a molecular beam, cross them, they are very low in energy, and the concentration is extremely low. Um, they then cross them with uh, a rare gas beam, and the rare gas binds uh, to these uh, to these clusters. And the question is, when you have, like in this case, uh, uh, the uh, 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 this uh, gold seven cluster, what is actually the structure? Which isomer is actually the one yet to see? And what you, what people have done is they have taken the measurement. That's the measurement down below here, where they do the following: they take a free electron laser. And we, I show you the one that we have at the Fritz Haber Institute. And they use the infrared radiation from the laser, from the free electron laser, to excite the, uh, the metal messenger uh, bond, so to speak. And when you do that, uh, you uh, uh, dissociate the bond. And then you measure with a mass spectrometer uh, the, um, the, um, um, uh, the abundance of the messenger coming away from the cluster. And if you do this, for uh, uh, all the various uh, available frequency, you can get something that looks like an infrared spectrum uh, 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 from that messenger. And you can see then by using calculations to compare with that it, in this case, it is this isomer that is actually fitting uh, the, uh, the experimental observations best. So we thought, well, if that is the case, we can do the same thing on the surface because uh, uh, binding uh, rare gas atoms to metal surfaces is something people have done 20, 25 years ago. Dietrich Menzel in Munich has done it many, many years, and so we can we can uh, we can uh, look at that. And uh, uh, we tried to do that, and uh, then the idea came up to use to, to create something that is called surface action spectroscopy, where we use an infrared laser to dissolve the messenger and use a mass spectrometer to uh, measure the uh, abundance of dissolving uh, species. The free electron laser uh, that was built at the, at the Fritz Haber Institute is shown here schematically. I don't want to go into the details, but the point is the undulator that uh, modulates the electron beam and creates sort of the, uh, the active, the active um, medium to uh, then uh, release the radiation is used and is filled with uh, an electron uh, accelerator and so forth. And you need a somewhat different one for depending on what uh, energy you want to range. And then you attach this uh, UHV machine to it, and then you can start to measure. Uh, the frequencies available are shown here. So you can go from rather low wave numbers uh, to rather high wave numbers. You can, you, you can span the entire uh, infrared range and even beyond. And you can, you can now use also terahertz frequencies going below. The first example that we choose was um, the vanadium trioxide example. We had looked at this for quite a while and we knew exactly what the structure is. Uh, the V2O3 structure is similar to the Al2O3 structure, but at the surface, the vanadium atoms at the surface do form double bonds to oxygen atoms. And these species, these vanadyl groups at the surface are unique. They are only present at the surface. And since we wanted to see how surface sensitive the technique is, we, um, we use that as an example. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the SDM image, and you can see there, uh, the, the Venable groups show up as these things, but you can also see that there are these spots where uh, obviously Venable groups are missing. And that's something that is, uh, shows uh, the, uh, the, uh, can be used to show the surface sensitivity of the technique. Here is the uh, result I wanted to show you. This is the, this is the, uh, the action spectrum here. And here you compare it to um, uh, a spectrum taken with standard infrared spectroscopy. And you see in infrared spectroscopy, you have these positive and these negative peaks, especially here, which come from the fact that in infrared spectroscopy, you always have to take a spectrum and related to a reference spectrum. In the case of an act of an surface action spectrum, that's not the, that's not necessary. And here is the one that we took with neon as a messenger. However, an interesting observation is if we use a heavier uh, messenger like argon, you don't see anything. Why is that? I come back to this. This is the comparison to eels. 
This is an yield spectrum of the same system, and you see the same peaks, but different intensities. And you also soon see that these uh, surface polaritons that you can see here at 686 are not surface species, not surface excitations exclusively, but they couple to the bulk. And that gives rise to a rise in temperature in the bulk material. While when you do this with the other techniques, uh, uh, with the other um, uh, 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 lines like here, there is no change in, in temperature at all. The, the, the system is extremely surface sensitive. You can see it here. If you put a little iron on the surface, uh, the whole spectrum is gone. If you took, put methanol, you see immediately the vibrational states of the methanol. Now, um, so you can take uh, the uh, actual spectrum without a, a different spectrum. So you can directly explain what this peak is, which is a negative peak here. And it, it is connected with what I, oops, with what I showed you before, namely, there are places where the vanilla groups are missing. And what happens if you have a missing vanilla group? Well, if you have six vanilla groups that have a certain frequency and they couple, if one is missing, what happens? The entire uh, coupling of the system goes to lower energy. And what do you see? It goes to lower energy. And that's exactly this defect state that you see directly uh, in this particular case. And so you can use this technique to, in, in a very surface sensitive way to measure these things, but you have to take the right um, uh, uh, messenger because what you need is you need an energy for the excitation that is big enough to desorb the messenger. And so if the energy is, uh, not not appropriate, then there will be no action. And this is why in the case of argon, there is no uh, uh, action. It's argon is too heavy. The binding is stronger. And uh, and so uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the most important part here is that if you want to do messenger uh, action spectroscopy, who goes to the lightest uh, messenger that you can get, which is helium, which needs a sample holder, which can appropriately be uh, uh, operated at uh, a few, one or two uh, Kelvin uh, to, to do the measurement properly. Just before I stop, uh, just one thing where you can directly see something that was a long debate in the literature, and that is for uh, magnetite, Fe304111, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, what is the surface termination? And because of the complex structure, the stacking of these various layers, there was a long debate, which is the right surface stacking of these things. And if we if we built uh, uh, an iron, uh, a magnetite uh, thin film and look at the structure, uh, then we get the surface action spectrum, which is this one. And again, if we use uh, that with the help of theory, we can calculate for the various terminations the expected spectra. And what you see is the only one that fits well is the tetrahedral termination. So it is the tetrahedral termination that is the, the most stable one for Fe304111. And that comes from a single uh, experiment with this surface action spectroscopy. Now, as a last comment, uh, you can use, or you should be able to use that. It's not done, the experiment has not been done yet. Uh, we, can, we should be able to use this technique to study the vibrational spectra of deposited clusters in great detail. Because what you can do is you can create these metal particles that we, uh, we looked at before uh, in the case of gold. And if you deposit the messenger as a given temperature and you can control the surface temperature of your sample well enough, you can find a situation where you only desorb uh, the, the messenger from the substrate, but not from the cluster. We have actually demonstrated this for a particular case already uh, that one can do this. But if we then, should be able to with the uh, the free electron laser to deter to excite this system then we get the information only from those places where uh, the messenger is actually located and that could give you the chance to determine uh, the vibrational structure of uh, deposited metal particles in a way that is very difficult otherwise because if you do infrared spectroscopy on these systems 
the surface phonon spectrum, which has high intensity, for example, in the case of gold, where the frequencies are very low, that it's completely swamped and you cannot see anything. So with this, I'm at the end. I hope I could show you that it is. It could be fun to uh, to um, uh, to look at the preparation, characterization, and reactivity of moral catalysts, and you can get some information that could be useful uh, if one uh, does this. And again, let me remind you, uh, Joachim Buda has given a talk in this in this series of colloquia where he showed how to transform that information that you get from these model systems also to a situation where you can, st can study um, uh, uh, electrochemistry uh, in these systems. We have not only shown it for you for, a, for the gas solid interaction in a, in a regular standard way, but we can also make, uh, we can create model situations where we can look at confined spaces. That's what I showed you. And uh, still surface science uh, gives you the opportunity to develop and study new uh, spectroscopic techniques that can uh, perhaps give you new information that was not available otherwise. So with this, I would like to close. This is the, the, the people in my uh, former department before I retired. Uh, we had uh, very strong collaborations with theory groups all listed here. We had also something we call post profs people who were f f retired from other positions and worked with us while Schneider, Dietrich Menzel and Eva Umbach were the prominent ones that we worked with. Uh, I had the pleasure of having a, a large number of Humboldt fellows, awardees and so forth. And they uh, really um, uh, helped us uh, a lot in doing the studies. This is a picture of the last uh, workshop of my department in 20, at the end of 2018. Uh, and you see a lot of colleagues uh, that had been associated with, uh, with the department. And I should stress again, as I always do, the work that I showed you is done by the young people. They should get all the credit. I am only the clown who presents it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a great talk. And uh, I, I think it, it was great in the sense that it showed where the state of the art is in, in the um, catalysis field and especially the surface science field. And like you said, we also discussed surface science, especially it's interfacing with electrochemistry with your Buddha. So please take a look for those of you who are interested in this. Um, and also with um, Ulrike Diebold, we discussed a lot of the STM of oxide surfaces. Thank you so much. And then we're open for questions. So uh, the audience can ask questions directly. If anybody has, please feel free to raise your hand or just ask it. Um, and maybe I can start with a number of questions. So one is related to oxides. If we look at the uh, at different oxides, there are different electronic properties, but now how deep do you think the properties um, how deep in terms of the near surface layer, the properties of the noxide determine the adsorption strengths of the molecules on the surface. So it's a few monolayers, 10 monolayers, 15 monolayers. It depends, it depends on the system. Uh, I mean, in the case of MGO, it goes rather quickly. It converges rather quickly. If you have a more flexible, electronic structure, like in transition metal oxides, you may, you may need uh, a, a lot well, or more layers to create a situation that resembles the, the, the bog situation. But it depends somewhat on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the material because it is also the way how the electrons of the metal, and it depends also on which metal you use, how they reach through uh, the uh, the oxide uh, material to actually influence the surface electronic structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it depends on the system. And I don't, I cannot uh, tell you exactly. Uh, uh, we, I mean, I, we have studied a number of samples, and I, for those, I can tell you. But what we've learned from it in general is that it is depending on the system. Right. So in some way, you can say that it scales inversely with the dielectric constant of the system. If you like so, sensitive yeah. states. For example. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Paul. Go ahead. Hi, Professor. Uh, hi, Frank. How are you now? Fine. 
Okay, I have uh, uh, two questions. The first question is regarding the uh, silica, silica film. So yeah. this is 2D material. I want to know, is it stable under, for example, ambient, pressure, ambient conditions, such as it, exposed to water or some it, CO2? It, it, is, it is extremely stable. You can peel it off, dip it in water, put it back on the surface, same structure. Absolutely. Okay, so stable. Okay. It's very stable. Yeah, and that's why we people are, are thinking about using it to, uh, to, 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 when you can rip it off, you can also stack it, right? You can put it, uh, you, can, you can try to, you can think of creating electronic devices because the silica uh, layer has a very uh, 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 good band gap close to, even though it's only two layers, very close to the bulk material, quartz. Okay, but the uh, let's see the the bulk layer is is three D three D dimensional. Yes. Uh, I mean, is there some difference between this two D material and three D? Of course, there is a difference in the sense that there are only two layers, right? But yes, the point is the following: um, we, what we have done is uh, we have compared the 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 structural information from the two dimensional layer with the known results in the literature from three dimensional layers. And what we have done is we have used the so-called pair correlation functions that people who measure uh, neutron diffraction or X-ray diffraction can also determine from uh, vitreous materials. I don't have the slide with me, but the, uh, if, we, if we take our larger SDM images and we, we decalculate from those the pair distribution functions, they are very, very similar to the three-dimensional structure. Surprisingly so. I mean, there are slight differences, but they are very diff very similar. And that was something that surprised us a lot. But it shows uh, that this is, uh, uh, and it's also the stoichiometry. It's perfectly SiO2 for the, for the bilay, right? I mean, this yeah. is, uh, this is uh, also a, a good indication. But anyway, I mean, that's, uh, that is, uh, yes, indeed, indeed the case. OK. So the second question is, thank you. The second question is regarding the, the uh, crystal uh, structures. I mean, when you have some defects, you will see some uh, like the five, seven uh, structures. I mean, is it, is it, is it a, a very general uh, phenomenon? Because when we see the, some SKM image of the water on the metal surface, you will have this, uh, I, mean, at, at, I mean, originally it should be the hexagonal structure, but always you have see some uh, five five member rings or seven member rings like this silica uh, films on this uh, substrate yeah, and also yeah yeah some carbon oxide it also shows some similar SPM yeah, yeah. images right right I mean that the the, the vitreous structure as I've shown you uh, is is very much uh, uh, resembling the prediction by Bill Sakariasen in 1932 who predicted that it would be all kinds of uh, n member rings that are created in the in the thing. And we asked ourselves the question, which of the rings are appearing first when you do the transition from, say, the crystal, where you have only six member rings, to the vitreous phase? And we did this through a LEAM study that I did not address in this talk because it was to have taken too long. But it's very clear that the first combination is you take four six member rings, okay, and you yeah. take the, the 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 intermediate bond and you flip it by 90 degrees out the out of the fix the four six member ring you create two five and two seven member rings yes and this is what people call the stone whales defect yes the stone whales defect is known from graphene as well and that's actually yeah. and and since the, our theory friends have <clears throat> done the calculation for the activation barrier barrier is exactly what we measure so okay. it, this this system really resembles the the um, uh, in, in 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 a wide range of, of areas the bulk material which is a little bit surprising, but um, according to all we know now it, there is a lot of correspondence. Okay, thank you, thank you for your explanation. Thank you. Basing. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? <coughs> Oh, yes. Very good yeah. to see you. Hello. How are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, nice to hear your, to, uh, hear your talk. And uh, it's really very great talk. Because I think from your talk, there is actually a lot of things can learn from surface science on catalysis, yeah. such as this very rich, particularly uh, regarding with this kind of electron interaction uh, and the electron transfer. So I, 
I want to ask uh, in in your example of this uh, molybdenum on calcium oxide affect the gold growth growth mode on, on the same film. Correct. How far? I always want how far and how many electrons need to change this kind of uh, from 3D to 2D. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you you only need you need only need a few electrons. I mean, it's I mean, few means I don't know. I cannot count the number of electrons, but it's of the order of say ten electrons or something like that, right? So you you put them at the rim. I mean, it depends, of course, on the cluster size, right? Mm. But it seems that in the larger clusters, uh, the the uh, the electrons are not lo located. Uh, distributed over the over the perimeter, but they are localized at specific kink sites. That's what uh, uh, Hanul Hekinen had calculated, and that's something that we are still investigating. Actually, I mentioned that we are developing a very fast SDM, and uh, Martin Sterra is involved in this, and we are looking at this in more detail. But uh, that's not completely solved yet. But in principle, uh, it is uh, uh, sort of the transfer of a, 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 a limited number of electrons to the defect sites of this two-dimensional things because it, they localize themselves in specific in specific locations. And that is where the action takes place. So from the shape of your 2D gold disk, does this mean also the, the electron also look like this? Is also confined in the, the electrons from molybdenum to, to, to the Oxide is also yeah, we, in the similar yeah, way. We have we have not done uh, the uh, same set of experiments on the uh, on the gold on the calcium oxide as detailed as we have done it on the gold on the uh, uh, on the MGO. Okay, I have to say so. Uh, th this is something that is in progress that is still being done, but uh, it's not. I cannot give you a. a, a a final, a final, final answer to this question: whether it happens there. But what we know is that the molybdenum is inside the calcium oxide. It's not directly localized at the surface, but below the surface. We can tell this. I showed you from angle uh, uh, dependent XPS. You can basically localize where the molybdenum, uh, the largest part of the molybdenum, is sitting. And it's actually beneath the surface. It's quite well distributed across uh, the film, and this is sufficient to uh, transfer the electrons. But it depends on the materials combination, again, right? Because it's a question of how much energy does it need to take the electron away from the dopant? And secondly, how much energy do you gain by putting the electron under the gold? Mm. But it's, it, and, and you can think of other combinations of metals and substrates where the same effect could happen, right? Uh, but we did not investigate that. So uh, since we also follow the idea, we also do some oxide thymbium on metal nanoparticles. Yeah, in my in, in my lab, just yeah. to see the effect of this uh, electronic structure of metal on the structure of the oxide thymbium. Mm -hmm. So so I think the thickness is very important for this kind of interaction. Absolutely, for, absolutely. For, particularly for us to observe this effect because the, the electron is always localized at the interface. Yes, so absolutely. since you have done a lot of things on, on, on the oxide thin film or metal, do you, can, can you tell me usually for deep, which kind of oxide the thickness will be how, how thick? Just I think this, uh, the similar problem to the first question because we'll, we'll just get puzzled <laughs> if, if but of course, the, your system is very clean, right? And the, the thickness can be controlled very well. Yes. So I, I don't know if you have any journal lesson yeah, to tell us. Well, I mean, I, as I showed you for, for MGO, we, we have done this study for various thicknesses. And I compared this four layers with 30 layers. Remember for the, for the surface yeah. chemical shift. While you do not see any surface chemical shift, which means the substrate is interfering for the very thin film, 30 layers mm. are completely sufficient to create a situation that you find on the bulk. Mm. But, but that would have to be studied in detail for other uh, systems. I mean, you have been uh, working on Syria a lot, right? And mm. Syria would be much more complex. Yeah, we, we just found that for Syria on silver or on palladium, we actually can get uh, Syria. Uh, C O C two O three. 
I, I just don't know. I think it should be very unstable. Un, un, unstable. But if we grow more thicker, of course, it will disappear. So I'm wondering, it still remain on the, at the interface, or it's really disappear, because we we cannot see it. It is possible always for at the interface. It will be always a CE two or three, or or, or as we grow thicker, the interface will also change. It will also change to CE four. Two. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a good point to study in detail. <laughs> can only uh, I can only. Uh, <laughs> Ask you to study in more detail. Okay, thank you. So I just got very puzzled by, by this some 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 results from powder system. It's really complicated. Not no, I'm not afraid to draw some draw any conclusions. Yeah. So it's it's really very puzzling. So thank you. It's really nice to hear your great talk again. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, maybe I can ask a few more questions. So um, one is related to the part number two, where you mentioned the limited space. I'm curious, I mean, maybe I'm, tr I'm trying to be a little bit naive here to raise the question. Sure. The limited space physically, what does it do on the atomic scale? So can I say that it just increases the, amount, the number of collisions? And if that's the right way to think about it, would that be an equivalent to a much higher pressure? Well, I think one has to be careful. Uh, it depends a lot. Uh, it depends a lot on uh, the, uh, the 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 space you have between the, the, the layer and the substrate, right? And mm -hmm. the size of the molecule. Already, when you have CO on the surface, which sticks up on the surface, there is a is a moderate interaction of the oxygen with the silica film. Hydrogen uh, in hydrogen, this is not the case. That doesn't play an important role. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and that will complicate uh, the detailed kinetic analysis uh, of the system uh, quite uh, dramatically. I mean, in our case, one could have assumed that water plays a very important role. And that's exactly what my starting uh, assumption had been, but I have been proven wrong. It is much more complicated. And one has to one has to see the interplay between these various uh, things, and also one has to take into account the fact, as I showed at the end of this part of my talk, that this system is not is not uh, uh, rigid; it is flexible, and this flexibility uh, has very strong consequences on what is possible but in the space below. And 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 uh, because it's not only the shift lateral, it could also move up and down. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, uh, it depends very much on the molecules that you're looking at. But but that's the same thing in in a in a in a in a moth or in a in a in a zeolite because of course it depends on what the size of the molecule is that you want to bring into these uh, cavities that will influence the reaction. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is. In this particular case, we can use uh, the theoretical results to really pinpoint what the detailed steps are. And if you get to more complex situations, that may be more difficult, but then theory gets more and more advanced and, and there are possibilities. All I want to say is that even though this is a great uh, rule uh, invented by the chemical engineers, that when you have diffusion control, it's, it's a factor of two less, it doesn't mm -hmm. tell you which diffusion control it is. This has to be done by a detailed right. investigation. Right. I mean, the system is pretty complex, so of course yes. you you cannot say for sure. Um, right. Okay. Another question is actually related to slightly different part of the surface science. I'm curious what you can say. I think I did not discuss it previously at the colloquium. So, um, I'm. The question is, can you? Use because I know that there are a number of studies, but very few that show that there is a big change in um, the the angle result photo emission spectra of the surface when the absorption happens. Mm -hmm. So can you use RPS measurements to study the electron transfer to the adsorbate from the surface or the subsurface? And if yes, then what kind of um, information can you really get from that? Maybe you you're familiar with these types of experiments. So let me see what, what's exactly the question. I mean, if we use X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or ARPAS, uh, ARPAS. In, the, in the in the UV range. Yes. So for example, we do on a metal that has no adsorbates and then which has adsorbates. Oh, yeah. oh, there yeah. will be a change in the in the very, very very strong change. 
Uh, yes, because, absolutely. For example, I mean, we have done uh, studies of that's a very long time ago. I have to, I have to remember when you put CO on a surface. I don't know what it was, nickel or something. Um, the, the, if you have a very strong bond of this uh, molecule to the surface, then of course, uh, the, for example, the band structure, which means the electronic structure of the mm -hmm. substrate. Is is very strongly influenced. In, uh -huh. in fact, in fact uh, uh, not only uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the in particular the 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 band structure of the two dimensional um, arrangement of molecules is 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 very strongly influenced. While uh, if you have a metal, you have this rather strong dispersions. If you have these strongly bound uh, uh, CO molecules, for example, it goes flat because in addition to uh, using the normal one electron excitations, you can have multi multiple electronic excitations uh, in addition, and that changes the situation completely. Right. So this is why I'm curious if you see that you we can get a lot more information than what we can get from regular XPS and from, say, STM experiments locally. Of course, if you, the RF if, studies. Yes, you can you can do that, and as I said, we we have not uh, done a lot of ARPAs in recent years because what you need is is in order to really be sure about the electronic structure, you need uh, rather well ordered systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and for the cases that I showed you today, uh, at least for the for the gold, you know, you, by definition, you have a disordered system. So for that one, it's it's rather difficult to use ARPAs. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot, by only looking at the at the uh, density of states, you can learn something. But that would have to be done in detail with calculations. For example, by someone who would calculate different cluster sizes <coughs> abound to to a metal support and so forth. But if you connect strongly enough to theory, you can do a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I have always to say, and I cannot stress this enough, combining theory and experiment is the crucial key to solving these problems. Right. So maybe this is where we can come to another question that is related to theory. What, in your opinion, we discussed this with the theory people too, but I'm curious about your opinion. What theory can and cannot predict for uh, solid gas reactions um, for the surface science, in your opinion, or it can do pretty much anything, and it's pretty accurate. Well, I mean, I think to say it in in a in a in a in a simple way, I don't think that just applying DFT uh, the way some people do it to all the systems is not sufficient. Um, we need to take, as I said, we need to take correlation effects into account multiple excitations, all kinds of things. So if you do a proper combination of, um, uh, you know, I mean, correlation, including uh, uh, Hartree-Fock based calculations, right? Uh, uh, co correlated electrons and so forth, you can get information and you have to properly combine it perhaps with uh, calculations on uh, using DFT because that's much easier to do periodic structures and so forth. But just doing a DFT calculation and thinking that's the solution to everything is certainly too simple. Hmm. Okay. Um, so maybe on that side also, because I, I think that in, at least in, in the field of electrocatalysis, there's a very clear problem right now. I'm not sure about the field of catalysis. I'm, I guess it's the same, but maybe you can confirm. We have a lot of people working with very poorly defined systems, nanosystems that just, um, you cannot really understand what you're measuring. You don't understand what you're studying. Uh, it's just impossible because of the complexity. In catalysis, is the problem the same? And if yes, then how do you see this breach between the modal systems and sort of, of this um, nano-sized and porous systems, zeolites, and so on. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms you, of understanding of the system, right? You you have to you have to slowly and 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 def, in a definite way improve and and in, or increase the complexity of the system and see what kind of things do you need to change to come closer to the situation. But it's not something you do on a Friday afternoon. It, it is it is really complicated. And also, then, you know, we are developing all these operando techniques. That is, when you have a, a gas phase with a higher pressure, 
uh, around what is is doing that and th these are all very important questions and i think the toolbox of surface science is not yet completely filled to mm -hmm. have to be able to really do everything on the kind of systems that we need to look at but we are we are constantly and systematically improving or increasing the complexity of the model systems and to me this is still a viable approach to mm -hmm. finally get an understanding of the more complex systems including um, the study of operando uh, things i mean especially when it comes to the liquid mm -hmm. how can you um, modify uh, the the say for example the 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 the, the scanning uh, uh, probe uh, micros microscopy to also be able to do this in, in in a liquid and people are working on this and I think that's very important because yep. then you can see then you can compare the same system under those conditions I mean that's for example that's what York has also been doing he has putting it it takes it, it prepares an ultra high vacuum puts it in the liquid takes it back off does the reaction takes it back off back off and sees what has changed. That's a first step. Mm -hmm. But it still involves, it, right. It is, it, is, it is not an operando thing, but it is a step in that direction. Absolutely. So th these are the right steps. People have to work on it. I mean, this is not something you do on a Friday afternoon. That's all I could say. Yes, but yes, yes. It, yes, took yes. Us, it took us to get to where we are now. For us, it took us, uh, you know, 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. This is this is where actually we come to one question that was asked in YouTube chat that I, I really like, but I will rephrase it slightly. It's about early stage researchers in catalysis. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice for them to how should they approach the field now? And especially given that building UHV systems, building surface science approaches, all the techniques is very expensive and tricky. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to just slide down into the field of simple measurements and and you know just sort of the search for the best catalyst the holy grail but not really understanding what they're studying so what would be your advice in those cases i mean to 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 be in this field on and trying to understand things at the atomic scale you have to be willing to spend time and you have to choose the right group to work on and you have to choose the leaders of the group in such a way that they are supporting the young people as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's really all the advice I can say. It's, it's an individual um, decision that a person has to take. Am I willing to spend the next five or six years to do this? I mean, they don't have to buy a machine themselves at the beginning, but they can work on existing things and also modify existing material. I mean, uh, uh, my last PhD student has built up this SDM from scratch, right? But then the PhD takes not two and a half or three years, it takes like four and a half or five years. People have been have to be willing to invest in this thing. For me personally, it has never been a question. I was just driven to do whatever I thought. But, and, 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 and that's really the only advice I can give because it is an is it is an it is a decision that you that a person has to take for themselves, and 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 I when when a, when a student asks me should I go to industry or to academia I I never tell them what to do I tell them look I will help you wherever you need my help but I will not tell you what to do you have to take that decision. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I mean, I, I do exactly the same. Maybe the only thing I can add to that question is, don't forget that there are a lot of free facilities, including synchrotrons, where yeah. you can fly, you can go, and you can use them. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, the final question that just now brings us to sort of the scope of the colloquium, which is electrochemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think we electrochemists can really learn from the solid gas reactions and from the heterogeneous um, catalysis field. Are there things that you think that we can really bring in our field or we can learn in, 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 in terms of the basic science? Well, I mean, what you can certainly learn is uh, the, the system, uh, you need to understand the complexity. You need to see it is, it is in, as I showed you in, in one case, it is not <clears throat> the particle size per se, but it is 
the, 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 the sites at the border of the particle and the oxide that plays the important role. And one has to get it into the brain that it is this complexity that uh, is, is, is needed to be understood. And that's the same is true for, for, for electrochemistry. I mean, in this case, you have this problem that you have also the liquid. And so techniques have to be developed to allow you to look into the same situation that we did in the, in the gap, but sort of the, the, the playground that you have to cover is more or less the same. It's just, do we have the tools in electrochemistry to, to study the same phenomena. If we do, can we say, oh, there are some similarities or there are strong differences or what are the differences? And that then makes the, 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 the point why, for example, could electrochemistry do better in this case than in other cases? Mm -hmm. So oversimplification is a, is a big problem then. Yes. The whole thing, yes. Okay, with this then we're coming to an end. Thank you so much, Professor Freund. So we're really happy to have been hosting you here and, and that My you uh, were able to yeah, spend time with us and on all this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the, the colloquy is over. Yes, uh, all the best and uh, have a good time and success in science. Bye-bye.